Hello everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Caroline Diate Edwards. I'm a director at Fortuna Admissions and I'm joined by my colleague Su Judith Silverman Hadara, um, who's also a fellow director at Fortuna. And we're going to talk to you today about your roadmap to an MBA. So some of you may be thinking about planning your applications um, for the fall later this year. Um, so we wanted to give you some key tips to help you plan the months ahead so that you'll be well prepared when, when the time comes to apply. So I'm just going to try and move ahead with these slides. Maybe can you move the slide ahead? Okay, so just before we dive into the agenda, I wanted to introduce our team at Fortuna. Um, so Fortuna Admissions started about five years ago, um, and we have a great team of people who have been gatekeepers at a range of top business schools. So you see some of the credentials of the team um, here on the screen. Um, and the idea was to bring together a team of people who could offer a different level of expertise um, and offer you know, the inside track on what it takes to get into business school. Um, and so we work with candidates typically over about um, two to four month period um, before their application to help them figure out how to best position their candidacy um, and then how to put together the, the various pieces of the puzzle that go together to, um, to present their candidacy in the best possible light um, to the schools to which they're applying. So our agenda for today, um, we're going to talk about why you might want to do an MBA. Some of you may be thinking about um, whether it is the right step for you um, in your career um, and whether it's the right preparation for what you want to do going forward. So we'll discuss um, the benefits of, of pursuing uh, the MBA qualification. We'll talk about how to go about choosing a business school um, and what are some of the different factors you should be taking into account as you think about putting together a target list of schools. We'll talk about um, then the various components in the process for applying to business school. Um, and then we'll talk about um, a typical timeline and how to um, plan the work that you'll need to do over the coming months to make sure that um, you've got everything lined up um, when the deadline comes and you've really um, done everything you can to maximize your chances of, of gaining admission to your target schools. Um, at the end, we, we've got some time for Q&A. Um, please feel free to post your questions at any time in the questions box on the right hand side. Um, so if a question pops into your head, please, please uh, type it in straight away and then we'll go through those questions at, at the end of the session. So passing over to you, Judith. Great. Well, I'm so glad to be here this evening and, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we wanted to talk about, at the very beginning of the process, why it is that you might actually choose to, to be thinking about or pursuing an MBA. And um, we've outlined a couple of the reasons that that might be coming to your mind right now. Certainly, um, number one for most applicants is being able to build your business skills and knowledge. So perhaps you've been working um, for a few years, you've been working for more than a few years, and you feel like maybe you're um, really not, you're not as aware of some of the, the facets of business as you would like to be, or there are certain holes in your skill set that you would like to fill in. Uh, you'd like to develop more management skills, or perhaps you'd like to really deepen your leadership opportunities. Um, and so certainly building your academic and business skills acumen is going to be such an important part of why you might choose to pursue an MBA. It's a wonderful way to get terrific exposure to a many, many different industries. Not only will you be in class with individuals that have come from a wide variety of backgrounds, but you're going to also meet faculty and staff members that have both worked in and taught about all of the different industries that are out there. So perhaps you're in a, a certain field right now and you're, you've been doing it for a few years, you're not sure if that's where you envision yourself long term. Um, and it's really a great opportunity to just take a deep dive and see what else is out there. 
um, be it listening to guest lecturers come in and lecturers, excuse me, and talk about their own experiences. Um, perhaps it's um, sitting next to somebody in a class that has a very, very different point of view than you do, and they're coming at a case set from such a different perspective, um, or even just people casually that you're interacting with in your clubs and over lunch. So a great way for you to really find out what other kinds of opportunities might be out there industry-wise. That goes along with access to network. With many of the schools that have program sizes of you know, 200 per class to as much as 900 per class, an incredible way to really connect across your own community and then if you think of the alumni network as well in many cases that can be quite vast so certainly uh, when I was working at Wharton there was something we had a program called take the call so it basically meant that if you were a Wharton student and you reached an alum they pretty much were bound to talk to you on the phone about a question you had about their industry or maybe an introduction um, so that network both is going to be important not only for your own career trajectory, but perhaps for partnerships and opportunities to create value in businesses that you might decide to start or join. Because career acceleration is also a main reason that many individuals will come online and decide to pursue an MBA. Um, you may be, be in a position where, you know, your firm says, you know, you really need to have an MBA in order to progress any further to make that leap from associate to senior to partner. Um, for some of you, it may be a chance to make a lateral and then a vertical move into a whole other industry. So this kind of opportunity um, cannot be underestimated. It's a terrific way to find yourself sort of, you know, a couple of years ahead of where you might have been had you decided not to pursue the MBA. As I mentioned, many people come into their MBA program you know, with a career. They might not love what they're doing. They might be looking for different kinds of options. Um, and a career change is, is quite a natural fit after post-MBA. So um, with the opportunities to engage with career services and career management at many of these schools, to really think about what you like about what you do and where you see yourself in the long run. What are, the, what are the pieces of your, of your professional development that you would like to continue to grow? And, and really, you know, pivot. Um, many, many people will do a career change, career pivot. Um, it's not unusual to come in with one set of expectations and find yourself exposed to so many different kinds of uh, ways to develop your, your professional growth. And certainly the ROI. Um, financially, you really, um, you know, can't underplay that an MBA is really going to accelerate your um, your, your, not only um, your management and leadership potential, but also your earning potential as well. So that ROI, although certainly two years of, in many cases, uh, of intense study um, with the cost of doing business, so to speak, uh, is pretty high. But uh, it's, you know, just a quick, a quick uh, glance at the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal will really show why, why that uh, ROI is, is so high for people that do hold an MBA. And we're going to go on to our next set of discussions. So I wanted to talk about how to go about choosing an MBA. Um, and I think that um, it's, it's important to think about what are your criteria for choosing a program. And a mistake that, that we see candidates make, um, that Judith and I see um, sometimes with clients at the start of the process, um, when we start to figure out with them, you know, what are their target schools, that the, there's a temptation sometimes to um, formulate a target list very quickly based on um, brand recognition of the schools, um, reputation, rankings, without necessarily looking into the details of um, whether the, the program is really the right fit for your specific interests and, and, and your um, future plans. Um, and also, uh, you know, Judith and I uh, both worked at, at um, as, as admissions directors at our respective schools. I worked at INSEAD, Judith worked at Wharton. And it can, it's very apparent um, when you're reading an application, if the candidate is putting together an application for, um, you know, for a laundry list of schools and hasn't really thought through carefully why they're applying to that specific school. Um, file readers are very um, experienced at spotting that. And so you need to think upfront very carefully about where you're applying and why you're applying there. And if you invest some time um, in this process up front, it will make you a much better candidate at the end of the day and will, will really improve your chance of getting admitted if you 
figure out um, which schools are really the right fit for you and, and, and uh, go through a good reflection process before you fix your list of schools. Um, so you need to think about you know, what are the things that are important to you and that will vary according to um, your background, um, your personal preferences, your future career plans. Um, and an MBA is, is pretty complex. There's a lot of different elements to take into account. Um, so, you know, beyond ranking and recognition, which is important, um, you know, you do want to go to a good school and go to a school that is going to have recognition with, with future employers and stand you in good stead in the long term. Um, but you should also think about uh, the, the curriculum. There'll be a lot of differences in some of the uh, electives that you can choose, areas that you can focus on if you have a specific interest in um, entrepreneurship or in the healthcare industry or in real estate. There'll be certain schools that will address those areas more than others um, and, and will attract other students with similar interests to you and also have alumni working in relevant positions who will be great networking opportunities for you. So do think very carefully about the specific strengths of the school um, and how that fits with your um, future career plans. Location plays a role. Um, so, you know, if you're in a big city, that will have certain benefits in terms of networking opportunities and the ease of meeting potential recruiters. Um, if you're in a smaller town, uh, typically those schools have a very tight knit community, perhaps tighter knit than, than the schools in the very big cities. So there are trade offs in terms of location. Um, it, it, taking an MBA can also be an opportunity to get exposure to a different location. Um, you might be interested in moving from east to west coast in the US or perhaps you're interested in getting, to, getting some international experience. So um, you can broaden your ge geographical reach through, um, through the exposure that you get on your MBA or indeed through an exchange program while you're um, pursuing your MBA. Think about the network that you're going to get access to and I think that's often something that candidates underestimate when they're thinking about applying for business school. Um, candidates typically think a lot about the experience that they'll have when they're at the school and then um, the opportunities that they will get straight out of school and, and, and the doors that it will open when they graduate. But actually, what pays dividends in the long term um, is really the network you get access to. And that's what will play a role continually throughout your career for the rest of your life. Um, so, you know, think very carefully about the makeup of the network, um, the types of industries that are well represented in that network and whether that's relevant for you and where that network is based. Um, I'm sitting here in, in the Bay Area. My husband did his MBA at Stanford and he has a fantastic network, really an unparalleled network here in the Bay Area. Um, I worked at INSEAD, I did my MBA at INSEAD um, and we've lived and worked in different locations and um, INSEAD has an amazing international breadth to its MBA network. So if you're thinking about moving around internationally, um, that's a great network to have. Um, so think very carefully about uh, the, the, the network that you're joining and, and what sort of role that will play in your life going forward. Different schools have different cultures. Um, some schools have a more collaborative, um, uh, close-knit community. Um, some schools have a reputation for having more competitive culture. So think carefully about what is the right environment for you. Um, of course, recruitment opportunities will vary. Um, by school, and then cost may be a factor. And you know, Judith mentioned return on investment. Um, schools that have a one-year format obviously have a lower cost overall, given that you're paying tuition fees for one year rather than two years, um, and then foregoing a salary for one year rather than two years. So um, some of the top one-year programs have um, do very well on the ROI rankings. Uh, and I would encourage you to, um, to take some time to think about what are the important factors for you and then do some serious research into those schools um, and also to visit the schools if at all possible. Things like culture and fit with the community can be quite difficult to gauge at a distance. Um, but actually, you know, when you get onto campus and you chat with 
the students, the staff, you sit in a classroom, you feel the dynamic um, in that community, you'll get a very good gut feel for whether that's the right place for you to be. Over to you, Judy. So I wanted to talk about how you actually apply to business school, which for those of you that are on the line, it's April, you're thinking about applying in September, and we generally recommend this kind of run-up. You know, it's, it's sort of, you know, six to seven months sort of makes sense. I know it's the middle of March, but I, I always sort of start with the beginning of April. Um, and you really want to do it very methodically. It can seem a little overwhelming, but if you take your time and start with your research, you're going to find that it's a lot more manageable. And I just had a conversation with a possible uh, student today who said, oh, my goodness, there's so much for me to do. I said, take a deep breath and just start at the beginning. So as you do your research, you really want to make sure that this is a good fit for you on a personal and professional level. You want to understand what it is that drives this community. Not just do they have what I'm interested in academically, but what would it actually be like to be a student there? Do I see myself in a large environment? Do I see myself in a smaller, more closely knit, as Caroline mentioned? What would it be like for me if um, there are certain kinds of things that I'm interested in pursuing? And there are a lot of other people that want to pursue this at, my, at the school as well. Is that going to be a problem for me, um, you know, going down the pike and, and eventually applying for positions post-graduation? So again, a strong fit, understanding what the schools say about themselves, and really getting a sense of what it is that you're looking to get out of a program. These are two incredibly intangible pieces of information that um, we really recommend that, that you do take a good look at as you dive into understanding the school. For those of you that are able to visit campus, we certainly recommend that. I personally recommend not going on a day that's a, an actual official visit day, but going on a day where you can you know, go to an information session and meet with current students, but it's not necessarily a day where they've rolled out the red carpet, because I think that those are the days that you really can learn so much, those, those sort of average Wednesdays in November, that you can really learn so much about what the school is like, how it operates, what the students are like when no one's looking, you know, really the genuine nature of the program. In your hometown or wherever you may be working, you can certainly attend local events, and those are usually run by members of the admissions committee, um, and there's, they usually do invite local alumni to attend as well. And then certainly with LinkedIn, Facebook to some extent, other alumni networks you may have from your own undergraduate education, Reaching out to alumni is a great way to understand more about the program. I generally tell students to reach out to someone two years, five years, and ten years down the road because you really want to understand not only what does the program mean for those that have graduated recently, but how does it play out a decade later? And where are the things that they feel they really gained benefit? Where are the things that they didn't think were so useful for them about the program? a tremendous way to really continue to infuse yourself with a deep understanding of the program. As, and, and that really does relate to understanding the school, understanding the values. I kind of tell people it's a lot like learning a foreign language and you want to understand not only, you know, what do they call their classes, do they call them cohorts, do they call them groups, do they call them teams, but you sort of want to get a real sense of, of what it is that drives them. Um, you know, what do they think about, what are the real important hallmarks, and usually you can find that in the dean's letter or in a mission statement, um, and, and begin to separate in your own mind what really matters to each of these programs. And then lastly, as you think about your own goals, personally and professionally, how does this school fit with what those are? As you imagine your career, post-graduation, and then further out down the road, you really want to start to align what it is you want to do with what it is they can offer you as a part of that academic and social community. So that making that case is really going to be such an important part of going through the application process. And we can go on to the next. Caroline, do you want to talk about timing? Yeah, thank you. Um, so most schools have three or four rounds of admissions. Um, so for the U.S. schools, it's generally three rounds. Um, there are a few schools that have rolling admissions, such as Columbia. Um, many of the international schools have four or, or more rounds of admissions, uh, which gives you a little bit more flexibility. Um, but be aware that uh, most of the places for the top schools will be allocated in the first two rounds. Um, so 
you should really be thinking about um, hitting the ground running for round one um, and applying to some schools in round one and some schools in round two. Round three can get really tight, uh, as I said, particularly for um, the M7 schools in the US. Um, very few places available in round three. And, and we do see um, some candidates sort of scrambling at this time of year thinking about um, you know, how to um, get into school for September um, and at this stage, you know, for the very top schools, it, it is extremely difficult. Um, at this time of year, you know, you do still have a few more options with the international schools. So as I said, um, some of the European schools have, have some more deadlines, so that gives you a bit more flexibility. Um, and INSEAD has just started um, processing applications for the January entry. So round one um, just passed yesterday. Uh, there's three more rounds to go. So um, if you're looking to apply in the next few months um, and would like to go to business school sooner rather than later, then that may be a very good option for you. Um, so for the schools that will start processing applications um, in the fall of this year, they will be publishing their deadlines um, normally around June or July, and they'll also release at the same time any updates um, to their admissions process. Um, every year there are always a few changes here and there to the essays and, and to the process, so do watch out for that. Um, and think about how to, um, how to uh, manage your timing and how to, uh, how, which schools you're going to apply to and which round. And, and typically what we see is that candidates um, struggle to do more than, I would say, three or really at the most four good applications in one round. Um, you, it is important to really tailor each application to a specific school. And if you're trying to churn through too many applications um, and you find yourself copy pasting material between essays, then it's not, it's not a good sign. Um, also remember that you're going to be making a lot of demands on your recommenders and um, they are probably um, very busy people and you don't want to overstretch them and you don't want them to be submitting something that is rushed and not well thought through either. Um, so you need to manage the demands that you're going to be making on them. Um, so in general I would say, uh, you know, think about three or maybe four schools per round. Um, candidates will often target their top schools in round one and then apply to schools a little bit further down their list later on. Um, but it can also work very well to do the opposite. Um, so uh, typically, you know, candidates will be applying to Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, etc. in round one and then move further down the list. But if you apply to some of those schools that are a little bit further down the list in round one, um, you may be able to make a more convincing case about your motivation for that school. Um, some schools that are in the in sort of outside of the M7, but still uh, you know, top top programs will see a bump in application volume in round two because people are applying after they've been dinged from other schools in round one. And they're very well aware of that, that people are applying after having been dinged elsewhere. I um, mean, if you apply in round one, then um, it, it can be easier to make a case for um, your, your clear motivation and your commitment to that program. Um, so, so think very carefully about where you're applying and how you're going to sequence your applications over over those months, and and um, don't plan on being over ambitious in the number of applications you can apply to at once, because um, that's often a mistake that the candidates make, and then spread themselves too thinly, and then um, don't do themselves justice with any individual school. Okay, moving on. So this is a, a really interesting opportunity to take a look at where you are and and where you want to be. Um, I think that it's unusual to really say, okay, I want to think about my life right now. And it's, it's, a, it's a great luxury. It's not something that people get a chance to do too often. And I really feel like this is the time to sit down or walk around or ride the subway and think about where, where are you? What do you like about what you are, what you're doing and where you are? And where do you, where do you imagine yourself? So um, it, it is a hard thing. It is really an opportunity to think about questions that you that you want to you want to ask yourself um, I think that 
compiling a list of good questions as we indicate, you know, what, what do I like about what I'm doing? What do I not like? Where do I envision myself? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Um, you, you know, look back on the things that people have said to you professionally and personally as you think about maybe performance evaluations you've gotten. Um, are, are you the kind of person if you were to, you know, if anybody were to ask me what I really want to do, I would tell them I would love to be a librarian. So clearly I'm not a librarian, but it's something that is always in the back of my mind. And I think that just about everybody I talk to has something. You know, I love, I would love, I wish I could do X, Y, Z. I would love to have the opportunity to, you know, try something else. And so I, I feel like this is a tremendous opportunity um, to really take the time, ask your friends, um, and think about, ask them, you know, where they think your strengths and weaknesses are. Talk to your parents, uh, or your sisters and brothers. You know, they'll be honest with you. And this is kind of a time, so many students, you know, that are coming through um, educational systems kind of do it very lockstep with the exception of perhaps a gap year. Um, but they, you know, they finish secondary school, they go to university, they get their first job, they get their second job. And here's a chance to really set a pause in your own life and, and think about where you envision yourself. Um, and who knows, you know, eventually you may find something that, that really, really deeply appeals to you and you're willing to make tremendous change to get there. Um, but this is, this is a great um, one or two year time to, to really take that deep breath and say, okay, now what? So I, I love this reflection piece, and, and it's actually one of my favorite things that, that we work on with our candidates. We can go on to academic yeah. preparation. So um, schools will be scrutinizing your academic profile, and so you need to think in advance about and the various components of that. They will look at your academic record holistically, so they will look at where you studied for your undergrad, the quality of the institution, what you study, they'll look at your transcript to, to see your individual grades, they'll look at your GPA, and then of course they'll look at your GMAT or your GRE score. Um, and as I said, now they'll look at it holistically, so if your GPA from your undergrad is not outstanding, then you can compensate for that um, to a certain extent with a strong GMAT, um, or vice versa. Um, so they, you know, they, they will often cut you a little bit of slack in one area, but you do need to show that you, that you bring um, strong academic skills to the table. Um, so th with the GMAT, um, it's important to demonstrate, or the GRE, your, your quantitative and your analytical skills. Um, and, and most people we see, you know, really need two or three months to prepare well for the test and, and get the best score that they feel reflects well on their ability. Um, so now is a good time to be thinking about that if you're planning for applications in the fall. Um, it's good to get the GMAT out, out the way sooner rather than later. You know, sometimes we see candidates who are scrambling to um, finalize their applications at the same time as study for the GMAT and um, taking the GMAT at the last minute, and that can become very, very stressful for you. Um, so um, you try to avoid that scenario. It's easy to to prevaricate with, um, with GMAT, it's not the most fun thing to be doing. I'm, I'm well aware that there's uh, more interesting things I'm sure you could be doing with your free time. Um, but you, know, you will feel much better when you've got it out of the way and um, you can enter the application process with more confidence once you've got a strong score under your belt. Um, so I'd really encourage you to get cracking with that sooner rather than later. Um, and um, in terms of what score you should be targeting, I mean, do look at the um, the average score at the schools that you're that you're targeting. Look at um, the eighty percent range that students at that school um, fall within. Um, if you've got a really outstanding profile overall and a very unusual profile, um, then you may be able to get away with a bit of a lower score than the average for that school. Um, if you've got a very common profile. Um, in terms of you know professional background going into business school, um, then you're well advised to have a GMAT that's above the average because you're going to have to unfortunately try a little bit harder to stand out from the crowd, and GMAT can be one one of the components of that. Moving on. 
we really recommend that you take a chance and a time, I should say not a chance, a time, to look at your resume. And although this is the one that you've probably been using and, and maybe helped you get your first and second job, this is, is really a very critical part of your application. Um, you want to be very quantifiable. How did what you do impact the people and the organization that you work or worked with? Um, this should have um, far-ranging um, opportunities here, not only what you do for a living, what you do uh, volunteer-wise, what you do community-wise. So it doesn't really need to follow only, you know, I, I, I worked here and I worked here and I worked here, but, but you want it to really reflect on uh, your academic preparation, your academic background, as well as the other kinds of things that you're involved with um, outside of, of, uh, your, of your work day. Um, you want to show that there is leadership and a leadership progression, a management progression, not only um, in, in your professional development, again, but if you've served on boards or you've been a member of a committee and then you've chaired a committee um, in an extracurricular activity, these are all things that really point towards your leadership skills. Um, and sometimes students will come to me and say, well, you know, I've only been working for three years. I don't really manage people. And I'll say, well, what about anything you do outside of work? What about organizations that you're involved with? What about informal mentorship you participate in? So I think it does take a little bit of time to assess there are other opportunities and other ways to think about the ways that you go through your day and the ways that you impact the world around you. Um, I did have somebody last year that used a lot of colors on his resume. Um, he actually, um, I think, changed the colors according to the school that he was applying to. So you want to make sure that this is very clear. Uh, there are templates online that you can look at. It should not be more than one page. Um, it should not have a lot of extraneous information on it. And you really want to give yourself enough time to start it, put it away, look at it again, have somebody else look at it. So this is a very iterative and reiterative process and sometimes can take as much as five or six times or even more. Um, to go to go around the resume. What is on your resume will also be reflected in your online forms. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit as well on the next slide. Um, because those, those uh, forms are really where the information is going to be kept for the reader of your application. And uh, it's not the kind of thing you can do the night before. It is certainly the kind of thing that you want to give yourself at least three weeks to a month to begin to prepare. And, and people always Students, I should say, always say, oh, how could it possibly take so long? It's just data, you know, about me and my background. And I said, oh, you're going to be surprised. Like, there are real questions that are being asked. You want to make sure that your data forms and your online forms are reflective of things that maybe didn't come up in the rest of your application. Uh, this is not the kind of thing that you can just sort of slam together the night before the application is due. And I actually tell students when they're tired of working on their essays, they can go ahead and work on their online forms because it's kind of a nice break, but it does require a lot of attention. And we can go on to the next slide, and Caroline will talk a little bit more about the essays. Thank you. Um, so when you start to think about writing your essays, um, Judith talked a bit about you know, the reflection process, and it's really important to have done that before you dive into the essays. Um, you want to use the essays to tell a bit of the story around your candidacy. Um, but the essays are often the most interesting part of the application for the far reader. And so you want to take that opportunity to give them some context about your story, about who you are, about what you bring to the school, and, and about where you're going in the future. Um, and, and, you know, as I said, it's often the most um, interesting part for the file reader. So you can use those essays to, to grab their attention um, and get them wanting to know more about you. And if they want to know more, then what they will do is invite you for interview. Um, so it's a great way to, uh, to, to lead them into your story. Um, what, what we see sometimes candidates doing, and a, a typical mistake that, that, um, that candidates will make in their essays, is they will be trying to um, fit into the mold that they think the school is looking for. And um, far readers, you know, have read thousands of thousands of essays. They will see through that very quickly. Um, and someone who writes really from the heart and is very authentic will come across much more strongly um, and will leave a much stronger impression in the far reader's mind. And if you think about, um, you know, far reader is plowing through um, a lot of applications in one day, they really don't have a lot of time for any individual application. 
um, you don't have a lot of time to grab their attention. So if you can um, get your unique voice across, if you can um, grab their attention and, and build a strong picture in their mind of what you bring to the school and what kind of student you will be, um, then you've got a much better chance of, of getting to the top of that pile. Um, so, so think about, you know, before you dive into the essays, what are the, the key strengths that you want to get across? Um, how do those fit together? And how do those work together to build a strong picture of who you are? Um, and the different elements of the application should really work together like pieces of a puzzle um, to build a strong picture of, of your candidacy. Um, so in your essays, don't repeat um, facts and figures that, that are already outlined elsewhere in, in the resume or in the application form, um, but use that space to tell, tell some of the backstory to, um, to your um, path, um, to your, about your career to date, and about your future plans. Um, and you want to get the school excited about where you're heading in the future. Um, if you get them excited about you know, investing in your um, future career plans, then they're going to want to, you to be part of their community. And that's really um, you know, the ideal um, impression that you want to, to leave in the far reader's mind is that you, know, you would be a fantastic addition to the classroom and a great addition in the future to their alumni network. Um, so, so use the, those essays to, to, uh, you know, to get your story across, to show the logical thread of where you've come from, why you're going to business school, and where you're heading in the future. Back to Judith. The letters of recommendation are also the kind of thing that you don't want to wait too long to kind of get started on. Most schools are going to ask you to supply one from your immediate director or supervisor. And that is the kind of thing that you really can coach them on. So you want to be able to think about the questions that are being asked. Typically, schools will ask as few as two questions, and then sometimes as, as many as six or seven. Um, usually, those questions are going to involve, you know, in what capacity do you know the applicant? How do they compare to their peer group? And then um, a lot of the M7 schools have questions such as, um, you know, tell us about some um, constructive criticism you've given the applicant and how do they respond to it. So this is why you really want to get some uh, letter of recommendation from someone that knows you quite well. Um, you want to avoid getting someone who may be the CEO or the CFO, but they don't really know you. So um, that doesn't help us, or the reader, I should say, quite as much as someone that really knows what you're like to work with on a daily basis. Um, and you want to, if you do have high profile recommenders, you know, someone who perhaps is um, willing to support you, they can do that without actually being a recommender directly. They could do what's called as, you know, a, a, an additional letter of recommendation, which gets sent directly to the school, uh, especially if they come from a realm where they may know faculty members or they may know the dean at the school that you're applying to. That kind of letter can go directly from professional to professional um, and doesn't necessarily have to count as one of your specific letters of rec. You want to make this really easy. So sit down with them, have a conversation. I'm applying to business school uh, in September or January. I would love for you to be my letter, one of my letter writers. Uh, this is what they're looking for. This is what I'm thinking about. And then go back to them and say, you know, I've given some thought to this, and here are the kinds of things would be really helpful if you could talk about. So without writing it for them, you can certainly give them a lot of information and a lot of really helpful data to answer those questions on your behalf. Um, and typically, we found that recommenders really appreciate that they have something to go on. So they're, you're, they're starting not from scratch. They're starting with you know, a, a good framework of, of things that matter to the school, things about your own background that are a fit for the program. And then you kind of give them um, an opportunity to be creative and, and talk about the things that, that they really want to share about your background. So um, you want to really start this pretty early. Um, I generally say, you know, approach them no later than sort of late June, early July, because many recommenders are going to be on vacation during August. So you don't want to be up against that deadline. Um, you want to gently check in with them throughout the process and keep them in the loop. You know, I think people really appreciate that. Let them know how you're doing. Let them know that you've applied. Let them know what you've heard. Um, and certainly, you know, a handwritten thank you note or, you know, a, co a coffee or a bottle of wine when this is all over is, is always a nice touch as well. 
Um, but for those of you that have written letters of recommendation, you sort of know what I'm talking about. It is not fun. It is always time consuming and it's always on a Sunday night when it's the last thing you want to be doing. So make it easy as possible for your, for your recommender writers. So moving on to talking about the interviews. Um, so it might seem strange to start thinking about the interviews before you've submitted your application, but once you've submitted your application, the, um, the interview decision might come sooner than you expect. And so um, we do encourage candidates to start thinking about the interviews um, well ahead of time. Um, also, if you're visiting the school or if you're talking to current students or alumni, um, that's a great opportunity to learn a bit more about the interview process. So um, do take advantage of those discussions that you may be having over the coming months to ask people about um, who you'll be interviewing with, the structure of the interview, what to expect. If you're talking to students or alumni, you can ask them about their interview experience and how it went and any tips that they have for you. Um, so, so it's a good idea to build that into the research that you're doing over the coming months. Um, different schools do have different formats for the interview. Some schools um, use admission staff um, for their interviews. Um, some schools uh, only have alumni run interviews. Um, some schools have um, a team-based discussion format. Um, so, so get familiar with a format that, that you will be um, going into um, so that uh, you, know, you can start thinking about um, preparing for that. And, and definitely, you know, it's a good idea to, to start well ahead of time looking through some sample questions. Um, typically, you know, they're going to be asking you some fairly obvious stuff. Now, you may get some questions that are quite left field as well, um, but they're, gonna, they're definitely going to ask you about your experience, about your career plans, about why you're applying to that specific school. Um, so it's good to start um, thinking about your responses to those questions well ahead of time. Um, and, you know, with some schools, for example, you don't have to write a lot in the application itself about why you're applying to that specific school. Um, and what I've seen um, sometimes happen with candidates is that they then get to the interview process and, um, and, and trip up when they're asked about why they're applying to that school because they haven't had to write that out for their essays and they haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it and, and putting together some clear reasons for um, why they're applying to that specific school um, uh, and, and why that's their number one choice versus other options. Um, so, so do start thinking about the types of questions that you could get well ahead of time um, because you know, putting together some strong responses is not something that you can do overnight um, the day before the day before your interviews. And then when the time comes to um, practice and prepare seriously for the interviews, um, do get some practice. You can sit down with a friend or a colleague, um, give them some sample questions, get them to run through those with you. Um, we do mock interviews with our clients. It's really useful, definitely. Um, practice does make perfect. You don't want to be over over rehearsed, but actually going through the experience of um, having to formulate your responses to the different questions can really help you feel more comfortable and confident on the day. Wanted to talk a little bit uh, about application planning and how you can kind of think about really, as we talked about earlier, how to manage the next several months and the application cycle. So um, it is fairly straightforward. Uh, around, right, right around now, you're going to start your, your school research. You're going to start to think about GMAT prep. Um, certainly, you know, if that's either something that you want to do on your own or if you want to use a company, um, it is a good idea to get that under your belt so that if you take it five months ahead, you can then take it again if you need to. As Caroline said earlier, you do not want to be writing and studying at the same time. We definitely recommend taking a time, a chance to really look at your own candidacy. Think about where you stand in, in six months ahead. Think about what you might be able to mitigate. If you didn't have any undergraduate quantitative classes and your GMAT is not coming up where you want it to be, can you take a class at a local community college or online in finance, accounting, or statistics? It's really going to shore up or create what we call an alternative transcript, um, an opportunity for you to show that you are, in fact, capable of handling the quantitative nature of the academic programs you're thinking about. 
Um, you want to also, if you've been involved in any organizations, you might want to look for leadership chances in, in these organizations. Um, it, it, it could be a time to maybe get involved in something new, although I do want to hazard and suggest that um, sometimes that's look, looked at with a little bit of suspicion, you know, just a couple months before you apply, all of a sudden you get really involved with something. Um, but certainly taking, taking stock of what you've been doing and are there things that you can kind of deepen those connections. And as we talked about earlier, you really want to identify those recommenders. Five months ahead, you'll be taking your GMAT. Um, and then you can see you want to really, in month four, start very much get that round strategy down. You want to understand who's going to be looking early. We know that there are certain schools that admit rolling and they admit almost before their first deadline. Um, I don't want to name them, but um, we saw it time and time again that there were great candidates for rent for their for their January deadline, but the school was, you know, had really seen quite a bit in September that they liked. Um, and so we wanted to suggest that you really think about that very creatively and, and certainly early in the game. You want to get your recommenders on board and think about your recommender briefs, as well as beginning those essay drafts. Um, and the reason we suggest four months ahead is because it does take time, and it is not going to be the kind of thing you're going to do day and night until the deadline. So you certainly want to give yourself an opportunity to start working on them, walk away, um, and as soon as you, you really begin to hit your stride with that, that story can be used in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different essays and interview situations. We talked about your resume and the number of iterations that it would take. Take a look at your social media. Make sure that it is um, set to um, settings that really only include your very close friends. Um, remove anything that might be con considered controversial or anything you wouldn't want your grandmother to see. Look, to be honest, I'm not going to tell you that as an admissions director, I sat and looked through everyone's um, Instagram feeds. But you really don't want anything out there that could be at all questionable because you may get a reader who's a little bored on a Saturday afternoon and they decide to Google you. You know, you never know. So you want to keep that pretty clean. Uh, it should not take too long to, to really straighten that up. We want to make sure you give yourself, and I know I sound like a broken record with this, get those forms together. Get your transcript ready. Get your employment history together. Make sure you have the right phone numbers in case the schools decide to check in and say, well, you know, what was the salary in, in 2015? And can you verify in, uh, employment? So this is, you do not want to be scrambling around the night before the deadline. I've, I've seen it happen too many times, and it's a shame because you can have everything else together. But if those online forms aren't ready to go, you're going to miss the deadline. And again, in the last month, making sure that everything is fine-tuned. I have all of my clients and all of the students, and this is just general advice, that they're done two weeks before the deadline. So then they can go back if they need to, but they are not sweating it on the actual last day. Um, and they're also able to manage the recommenders, making sure that things are submitted in a timely fashion. So that's sort of our seven-month approach. Um, I think it works. I've had students that have followed it and feel like they're constantly doing things, but it never really feels like a rush, and which is why we feel over, over time this has been a really good approach for the students that we've worked with. <coughs> okay, um, we're so go on. that... Yeah, that, that wraps up um, the information that we wanted to run through with you. Um, we would encourage you to sign up for a consultation. We'd be very happy to discuss with you your individual profile and, um, for example, you know, which schools could be a good choice for you. Um, so please do uh, contact us. You can sign up on our, on our website on the free consultation form or shoot us an email at info at fortuneadmissions.com. But before we go, and we're happy to take some of your questions. Um, so I think we have a question. Um, Judith, could you comment on um, someone who has, we mentioned earlier, um, you know, round three can be tough, particularly for, for a common profile, and it can be harder for, for people who come from an engineering background or a consulting background um, to, to stand out amongst the competition. Um, so do you have any suggestions for someone with, with a quite a common profile um, for how they can stand out in the applicant pool? So I, I really feel like telling the story is going to be so important and really taking the time um, to understand the, the program, to do a lot of outreach to the school. Um, and, and this is going to vary from round to round. 
So I, I feel like, you know, if, even if you think that you're coming and everybody's going to sound like you and you're coming from a, from a group that's overly represented, you do have an individual story to tell. And you don't have the exact same background as everybody else that's kind of coming through the, down the pike. So I think that, yes, um, round three is going to be tricky, certainly, um, for, for applicants. And, and most of the M7 schools are just at that point filling very, very specific holes in their incoming class. Um, but for round one and round two, it, it is a chance because you're more than just what you do for a living and you're more than just the school that you went to. So to me, it's really having the faith that you have other parts of your background and other parts of your personality that you really want to share with, uh, with, with, um, with the admissions committee. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a terrific question and I think it is, it is a tough one because I think also, all too often, we sort of just think of, of ourselves as, as a product of what we do or where we went to school or, you know, what we want to do when we graduate. And in fact, there are so many other parts of that story that, that I really think are, are wonderful ones to share. Yeah. And I think also, um, you know, but if you've got a common profile, it can really help to get someone else to help you think about um, how to uh, position your candidacy and what are the things that make you stand out because when it's your own profile sometimes it's difficult to figure that out yourself there may be something um, that you've done or some aspect of your your background that does make you unusual in an applicant pool but you might not be aware of that um, so that's something you know that we're often able to tease out um, when we do an initial analysis of a candidate is to, is to bring a fresh pair of eyes and um, hold a mirror up to them and, and help them see what it is that actually is quite unique about their own story um, that they can use and showcase in their application to, to help them stand out. Um, and I would agree with you that sort of, you know, um, having, sometimes when you say your own story out loud, you also realize that there's a lot in there that you can work with which is why, you know, I, I, Carol and I, and I both really like this part of the process, which is the figuring out piece, you know, in addition to working on the essays and the resume and the re letters of recommendation, it is helping to set that stage. I love those conversations and they're usually, you know, very robust um, and, and, and a great sort of jumping off point for, okay, well, you know, I, I'm thinking about it this way, what do you think? And a lot of, of very healthy conversation around how to best position. Yeah. Uh, we have a question on how much work experience is required. Um, so, I mean, it varies by program. For the U.S. schools, I mean, typically two years is, is a good minimum. Um, for the international programs, the average number of years of work experience of students can be a little bit higher. Um, so, for example, at INSEAD, it's about five and a half years. Um, London Business School, it's about five years. So you certainly can apply with less experience than that, but just be aware that um, it can be more difficult at a very early stage in your career to demonstrate progression and to show what you've achieved and show that you're on a really strong track. If you can show that at an early stage, then, um, then great, you can, you can go ahead and apply. Um, but what we see is that you know, sometimes candidates need sort of three to four years of um, you know really strong work experience to have some great stories to help them help them stand out. Any other thoughts on that from the uh, the U.S. perspective, Judah? I think it's it's really a question of you know what it is that you've accomplished in those years and what you feel you're going to be able to bring to the table. Um, we have a lot of students that think about oh I don't really like my job I've been working for a year and sometimes going to business school is not the right next step. You know, it, it's finding another job. It, it should be the kind of thing that you're going to be able to give and bring as much as you get and take. And, and that is, is really a hallmark. And it does, you can, you can sort of look at the average number of years of work experience um, that, that schools suggest. They just really want to make sure. And, and again, when I was at Wharton, and I know that Caroline um, knows, has this as well, like it, it was just making sure that it was going to be a really valuable experience for you. And if you hadn't ever managed anybody, you might not have gotten as much out of the conversations in the classroom as those sitting next to you that had had those, you know, kind of challenging conversations. Um, so there's no sort of um, absolute, you know, uh, the Harvard program and uh, Graduate School of Business at Stanford do have a two plus two program by which you apply straight out of undergrad, you go out and work for two years, and then you come back and do your MBA. 
um, those are, are pretty um, specific programs. Wharton also has one, which is um, even smaller. Um, and for the most part, you know, there, there is going to come a point where a, sort of af after eight or nine or ten years of working, you may be looking at an executive education program. Um, or a mid-career program, one that's going to sort of suit your needs a little bit better than, than someone who's just a few years out of undergrad. Yep. Um, so uh, another question, um, what is the most important part of the application? What do you think about that, Judith? Um, I would say it's the essays. I think that it's really the opportunity to showcase who you are what it is that matters to you. It's not the scores. It's not your transcript. It's not what you do for a living. It is just that, that chance to take a page or a page and a half um, and to really put it out there. And, and, to, and that's where your personality comes through. Um, I know that uh, Dee at Harvard was fond of saying, you know, it's not an essay writing contest. And it doesn't have to be well written, so to speak. I, and I, I don't mean it like it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be, you know, sort of very high philosophy. But it needs to be really genuinely you. And that's the part that as a reader um, and as someone that was going through, and I would read, you know, 100 consultants over a weekend. And, and yes, that's what they did for a living, but that wasn't sort of what, what they were as individuals. And I really feel like those essays can give such a, a great light into, into what makes you tick. Uh, and then I would also second that with letters of recommendation. Um, I feel like those are also quite telling. They give terrific insight. Sometimes they even tell you more about the applicant than the applicant does themselves. Um, Caroline, I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, no, I would agree. I think um, the essays are your opportunity to, um, you know, to, to tell your story. You know, you have limited parameters with the online form, with the resume. Um, you know, you, you have to get those facts in there and you, there's this, there are limits to how much you can play around and how creative you can be. But the essays give you a lot more scope and there's no set formula for the essays. There's a lot of different ways that you can play it. Many of the essays now have quite open questions. Um, so, you know, there's, there's an infinite number of ways that you can tackle it. Um, so that's a great opportunity for you to really, um, to, to, grasp that opportunity to tell your story in a different way and um, that's often how a candidate will will build a picture that will stay in the file reader's mind um, and that's you know what you want to do is to build a strong image so that when they're filtering through then and figuring out who gets to go to interview and and who doesn't um, your story is is right at the top of their mind so so I think that's um, all we have time for. If you if you have any questions that we didn't have time to answer, then please do get in touch with us. Um, as I said, we'd be very happy to to speak with you on a consultation or fire us an email at info@fortunaadmissions.com. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I hope it's been a useful session, and um, we wish you the best of luck over the coming months. And um, you know, be very happy to talk with you further about your MBA plans. Thank you, everybody, and, and good night or, or good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are. <laughs> Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Judith. Bye.